This is probably the most common big question that is on the minds of anybody who runs any business who has to hire people. Um, how do you detect talent? How should I know that when I have two applications before me, that this is the better one for me and that is the less good one for me? We know that we're terrible at making these decisions. We hire the wrong people all the time. Okay. So the question is, how can we do better? Well, one way we can do better is by knowing what are our biases. How do we make decisions about talent? And we did some studies um, looking at how we make decisions about musical talent. Um, when we listen to music, uh, certainly uh, people who are expert can say that if they listen, they can tell the difference between the one who is really good and the one who is less good. And, and that experts should be able to tell, but that novices, maybe people who are not expert like me, maybe we cannot tell, but they can tell. And, and, and often they can. If you give them two recordings made by a high school student who is still struggling and, you know, somebody like uh, Segovia, they will tell you that the Segovia playing is better than the high school student. So we know that they're not completely off when they say that. But we are more interested in when two people seem to be equally good, does our mind have some beliefs about them that will make us actually hear the music to be different? If they are right, if the artists are right, that they're objective, and all they do is they listen to the sound, then there should be no difference between what they, what, what they tell us is good music and the actual objectively better musician, right? So, all right, so here are the studies. You describe to people, you say, here is a musician, musician A. Musician A is very, very good. Musician A has done all of the studying and they have produced many interesting pieces of music and they have performed and they have won awards. Okay? But in the description of the musician, we add one sentence that says that this person seemed to have natural talent. We also tell them about another musician who is identical in quality. They've got good, good education, great practice, they've produced good music, they have won many awards. Technically, they're equal. But for this one, we say, we don't say they're naturally good. We say they are very hardworking. They strive. They practice for many hours a day. Okay? Now, when you, then we actually, so they know that. Now you listen to a piece of music that is being played by both of them. But the piece has been judged to be equal in a neutral context. So we know it's, a, in fact, you can give them the same piece of music. Okay? And we have them listen to it and we say, tell us, which one is better? In every case, in every study that we've done, we find that even if two people are equally talented, our minds tend to prefer the one who is natural. There's something about the one who seems naturally gifted that makes us think that they're better than the ones who work hard. Even though they've reached the same place, even though the music is identical, we tend to prefer this. So we go to musicians and we ask them, tell us, what's more important in the world of music? If you had two equally talented people, one was naturally gifted a little bit more than the other. The other worked much harder. Which one would you pick? And they say to us, we would pick the hardworking one. Because they say, we know that there are many naturally gifted people, but who actually achieves in our field are people who strive and strive and strive and work hard. Okay? So they will tell you that they will prefer the one who is the striver, but when you actually give them the music and you have them listen to it, they pick the natural. They do this over and over and over again. So what do we have here? We have, again, two conflicting things going on in the same person. On the one hand, we have a theory. Our theory says it is a good thing to look for the striver because they will stick with it. Yeah, you know, the natural may not even play very well after a while because they won't bother. But the striver is the best. And of course, they're all very good. So we're not talking about you know, people who are not so good. They're both excellent. And that's when you have to make some of these choices because for a symphony orchestra that has to decide on which one to pick, and, and, and we are quite surprised that on the one hand, they will say we should pick the striver rather than the natural. But when we give them the actual data and we say, which one would you pick? 
they pick the, the natural over the striver. In our heart, we really love people who we believe are like Mozart, right? We believe that there's something about some people that God has put something in them, and they're so special that no amount of hard work can ever fit. And, and our stories and the movies we make only make reinforce that. So we actually believe that this is a problem, that we are losing good talent, probably, because in many spheres, it could be in the area of sports, it could be in the area of business, where we tend to put more emphasis on who seems to us to be naturally gifted, when in fact, we should know that we have, we're not saying how, how one should pick, but we are saying that it is quite interesting that even amongst experts, there is a very interesting difference between the ones who, between what they say and then what they do. So the question that one might ask, first of all, is, is this generalizable? Does this happen in other fields besides music? Maybe music is a special quirky area where people seem not to know what they really uh, want. It's not true. It actually turns out it also happens in other fields like entrepreneurs. If we say this is an entrepreneur, he started a new business. Ever since he was a young kid, he always had an entrepreneurial streak in him versus this entrepreneur works really, really hard. They've both achieved the same amount. Which one would you hire? We tend to prefer the natural one over that. So we know that it happens more generally. I think that the really interesting question and one to which there is no simple good answer is, do we really know how to hire? And I'm going to argue that by and large, whether it's academics like me hiring other academics, whether it is people hiring symphony musicians, hiring teachers, hiring a CEO of a company, um, we are pretty poor at predicting how well people are going to perform. We should know this because most people have incredible trust in their decisions. They believe that they can find who the best person is. But there is a lot of evidence suggesting that interviews, for example, are terrible that interviews actually make us make worse decisions than if we did not interview people. If we just read their work, we may be safer than actually sitting across from them and talking. Because think about it, when you talk to somebody, so many things about them now can influence your decision. How similar are they to you? Did they go to the same school as you went to? Oh, if they did, you like them more. But that's not necessarily good for your business that you find them to be similar. And yet most of us are drawn to people who in some way remind us of ourselves. And so to that extent, we have to be very careful. Interviews are very difficult. There are also many interesting studies on the structure of human faces. Based on the structure of a face, we make decisions about people. We think Mazarin looks trustworthy rather than being not so trustworthy. Why? I don't know, but you might think I'm trustworthy. But that may be a mistake. I may be a big crook, and you would never know that because you're using some information about my eyes, my nose, whether my mouth is turned up or down. And these are silly little judgments about the structure of my face. How competent am I? If my eyes are closer together, I will look less competent. If my eyes are further apart, I will look more competent. But these are not the right dimensions on which we should be hiring people. And yet we continue to. So I think the broad general question of talent and how to, uh, how to understand what talent really is and use it. We spend billions of dollars um, on the planet every year trying to make these decisions. And by and large, we're pretty bad at making these decisions. And so one of the hopes is that the science of understanding how we make these choices will develop enough so that we will be able to say, if you're interested in a person to be a salesman versus somebody who you want to be a data analyst or whatever, that there are certain properties that you might want to look for and not for the interview. Uh, very soon, I think interviews will seem very old fashioned to us. I think that the act, uh, the, what, goes into, what goes into the decision about whether to pick somebody to be a colleague, somebody you want to hire for your business, is the same kind of mechanism that goes into choices about who should be our partner, who should be a romantic partner, who should be a life partner. And I think in many ways we go equally wrong. If you look at the data on divorces, well, certainly it suggests that only half the people even are making. And when it's half, then by chance you could just flip a coin. So next time you want to decide if you want to marry somebody or not, flip a coin because maybe the coin is a better predictor than your own assessment. I was born and raised in South India. In the culture from where not my little community comes, but from where the broader community comes, 
the way people married, and they still do, is by a system called arranged marriages. There are people who have children who are boys and people who have children who are girls, and they try to find who's the right partner for their child. And they do this in a fairly um, rational way. They match up people by socioeconomic class, so the rich must marry the rich, the Brahmin must marry the Brahmin, the low caste must marry the low caste, and so on. And so they do all of this matching. Now, in the West, we think this is horrible. We say, these poor kids, they have no choice. They have no free will. They cannot exert their own opinion. They cannot just fall in love. Somebody is putting them together. Okay? But the interesting data are that the happiness rates in both systems are about the same. <laughs> whether you choose or whether your parents choose, leads to about equal levels of happiness or unhappiness in, in the marriage. So one is not necessarily better than the other. What I would say is all existing systems today are equally bad. The best way for us to become better and better and better at making these is to invest money in, in analyzing large databases. So imagine that every company gives us their data on who did they hire, and we have all the data on the properties of the person. How tall are they? How short are they? How smart are they? How much math do they know? Uh, how, how, how agreeable are they? Are they outgoing or introverted? Let's say we know everything. And we get this, and we get their data on their success rates. We can just crunch and crunch and crunch these numbers, and we can spit out nice little models that may say, look, this is the type of person who's successful. If you want a person who has to sit there and analyze uh, you know, data on the economy of Brazil, do not go looking for an extroverted person. <laughs> Just find a quiet, shy person and put them in a room and let them solve that problem. But we don't think that. We think outgoing people, people who are friendly, are always better than people who are less friendly. So I would say investing in big in analysis of large databases, which these days on the web are becoming more and more possible for us um, to harvest, that's going to be a future in which we will come empirically to the question. Uh, we will be doing it based on evidence rather than based on our ideas about who is a good hire or not. One of the messages that we should uh, give about what psychology has discovered over the last, let's say, you know, 30 or 40 years is the idea that we should not trust our intuition, that we should try to go with the evidence. <laughs>